Welcome to Inspired Edinburgh, the home of powerful conversations. I'm Elliot Reeves and my guest today is Kevin McMahon. Kevin, better known by stage name Kevin Quantum, is a magician-scientist hybrid. In 2005, you paused your physics PhD to take part in the Channel 4 television programme Faking It, which showed your journey from scientist to professional magician and was watched by more than 6 million people. Having spent the first 10 years of your adult life completely immersed in physics and the next 10 in magic, you're most likely the only person on the planet to have reached the 10,000 hour threshold needed to qualify as an expert in both fields. You're a member of the Magic Circle, founder of Magic Fest, have enjoyed five star sellout shows at the Edinburgh Fringe, were trained by Penn and Teller, appeared in BBC documentaries, consulted for the National Theatre of Scotland, performed to countless celebrities, broke a Guinness World Record, were the first magician to perform at the Globe Theatre in London, and you were nominated for the Scottish Comedy Awards 2014 and 2015. You're also one of the very few people that counts quantum physics as a hobby. <laughs> Kevin, it's an honour to have you here. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. No, I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to have you here. Um, you've got an absolutely fascinating backstory and background and uh, yeah, this is going to be a, a good one. I mean, you list it all like that. It's <laughs> Normally I have someone that helps me with my press releases, so it's uh, I don't often get to hear it said out loud. I kind of read these things on paper and review them and decide whether or not they're going to get the, the green light to go ahead. But yeah, yeah it, it's, it's almost like, ah, oh, yeah, you know, when you get stuck sometimes in your career and you think, oh, you know, I've actually done, I've done quite a bit. I'm, I'm happy with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, hearing that and kind of reflecting back on it, what does mm. it, what does it bring up? What do you feel? Uh, I feel pride. Um, yeah. As we're going to discuss later, I got into magic quite late. And I felt at the time there were a lot of doubters that didn't believe that I would be able to make a career out of this, that right. I would stumble, uh, that I would find myself back in physics. But when you say all that, you know, I, I feel like I've done well. I've, I've found my place in magic and I've made an impact. I've, I guess I could, when you say all that, I feel I could be of inspiration to younger magicians. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. That's what it makes me feel like. Yeah, yeah. I, feel, I feel proud, yeah. That's brilliant, good stuff. So, I mean, you know, going back to your, your early life and, and growing up, I mean, what, what was that like? Uh, so I grew up in, uh, in Fife, in Resyth. Uh, I was one of the eldest of four children. My father worked in the dockyard, in Resyth dockyard, mm -hmm. um, until it, kind of was scaled back, let's say. Okay. And there were, uh, my earliest memories are when I was two years old, you know, I've got memories from when I was two. I can remember when I was crawling around the house. And uh, I know it's a bit of a weird <laughs> thing to say, but I, I do have these memories. I remember being faced with, my, my earliest memory, if we're going to go that far yeah, back, yeah. is uh, crawling up this weird kind of stairs, but the stairs weren't kind of square shaped, they were circular shaped. And I think I remember them because there were stairs that were circles and I could get up and down them uh, <laughs> on all fours. <laughs> Whereas most stairs scuppered me. So um, that's my earliest memory. But I was the eldest of four kids. Uh, we were schooled at the local, one of the local high schools. Mm -hmm. um, I was two boys and two girls. I was, I was good at passing exams, so I, I often found myself at the top of the class for, for most of the things that I studied. And um, yeah, I guess that I was, I was on course for, for going on to university or for further and higher education after leaving high school. Yeah. I had a really happy upbringing. My mum and dad did amazing. Um, I have a wonderful brother and two younger sisters. Helen's a bit of a globe trotter. She's trotter. She's living in Canada at the moment. My youngest sister Mary lives in Edinburgh. My brother Oliver. He's the most stable out of all of us. He's married, three kids. He lives up in Dundee. And myself, I'm a, I guess I'm a father. I've got a daughter who's four. And my wife and I, we live in Inverleith in Edinburgh. Oh right, excellent. Yeah. So I, I had a really fun upbringing. It, it grounded me. Um, I feel like they're a real rock. A real. I rely so heavily on my mum and dad, even these days with, with uh, child care, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> really, they kind of, so I think sometimes they, you push away when you're at university and you're starting your career and then suddenly you become a father and you realise how important it is to have your family close again. But mm -hmm. my, my close family, my extended family, my cousins, I'm, 
I feel really proud to be part of the McMahon family and I have a great relationship with pretty much all of my cousins, my aunties, my uncles and extended family. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, when did your passion for physics, uh, that, it, it looks yeah. as though that was your first love, if you like. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> when, did, when did that first start? When did you first realise that that was something that you really liked? Uh, physics, I was always inquiring. I had a bit of an engineer's head on me. So okay. when I was, I remember at primary school, I took apart our television just to try and understand what was going on. <laughs> uh, you know, this whole moving oh. image thing. It was an old CRT, a cathode ray tube machine. I wasn't able to put it back together again, sadly. I wasn't, I wasn't gifted, you know. <laughs> I, was just, <laughs> I, I was always one for half jobs, you know. I was happy to take it apart. Um, and I, I remember always being really intrigued by the whole thing. I remember at primary school, um, my, my, uh, my dad's older brother, his son was really into computing and he sent up a, a ZX Spectrum uh, 48K at the time, it was a plus, and I got really into that. I started learning. They sent up a few books on programming as well. So I was programming in BASIC when I was, uh, you know, eight or nine years wow. old. I was, I was really fascinated by how these things worked. And I was, you know, I was essentially uh, colored by number at the time, you know, <laughs> but I still, I remember looking back on it and I was constructing it was only when I got to university I realised what I was doing, but I was constructing quite complicated um, lines of code that was using algorithms that were four commands, if this happens, you know, all, all yeah, this sort yeah, of yeah. thing. It was, so I guess I, I was always really into that. And then I got to high school and uh, I don't, the physics department wasn't, the teacher I had was a really good scientist, but he wasn't a good teacher. Mm. And I ended up buying a book on physics, like a small um, standard grade, teach yourself standard grade physics book and ended up working my way through that. It didn't sort of slow me down. I quite liked working at my own pace anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, so I really, I just loved how things worked. I was always fascinated. I was with my daughter this morning at this Montessori morning thing. Do you know Montessori? Have you heard of this? No, I haven't, no. Oh, it's this kind of new age way of teaching children. It's the way that Oh, the Facebook founder, he, he was educated in this system oh, right. and it's kind of learn by play. I quite like it. It's pretty cool. So anyway, we went to this thing and I was teaching Olivia, my daughter, the planetary system and I was upset to find Pluto not there anymore. Yeah. You know? <laughs> All these things I'd learned as a kid and it took me back to when the books I had on space and uh, satellites and uh, how things worked and I just really was fascinated by the world around me. It was so intriguing and exciting mm -hmm. and uh, I guess it was around that time as well that I, um, I never thought of magic as a career but I did like magic as a kid as well so I had uh, I was one of these kids that would take out all the magic books at the library and so no other kid could learn the secrets <laughs> <laughs> have them on constant renew you know yeah Crazy, but um, so I, I did love physics back then and science and just it was more of an intrigue in the world around me. I wanted to know how stuff worked. Yeah. And that's, yeah. That, so I, whether it was my, my bicycle, I did all my repairs on my bike, my push bike, I, I guess everyone did. Or whether it was my television or programming or, um, I mean, music as well. I was really, I played violin back then, viola, guitar. I just liked things, how they worked. I liked structure and understanding how things fitted together, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, it sounds like a very sort of uh, child, you know, I think because I think it's a natural thing for a child to be inquisitive. Mm. And I think as, as many people get older, they kind of lose that a little bit as they, they go into kind of society. I guess um, so. Yeah. Whereas you've obviously kind of maintained and yeah, cultivated that. I try to. The people I'm surrounded with, though, are very inquisitive. And mm. um, yeah, the people that I collaborate with on magic or, or even other projects, they're often people that I am really amazed at their look at on life, really. I, I, I learn from that. I try to just remind myself not to get stuck on on what's easy and just try to think a bit bigger. And, and that's my philosophy is, I don't really have a philosophy, to be honest. I, I guess the way that I live, I, I, I do something that I love and mm. uh, it's really important to me. That's, I love that, I really yeah. do. <laughs> so you, you went uh, to do a PhD in, in physics. Yeah, that's right. So um, uh, once I'd finished at high school, I had to go to, this is a thing that was funny, I had to go to a different high school to study physics because my school wasn't doing it at sixth year studies. So we, okay. there was a school across the road I had to visit and there was always quite a, 
a rivalry, um, uh, probably on religious grounds more than anything else. I was at the Catholic school, that was a non-denominational and there was always this kind of thing. So I remember, mm -hmm. um, but it was quite satisfying to go over there and then study physics and uh, kind of win their win their award for physics um, <laughs> and, and come back <laughs> with that. They didn't have a choice but to give it to me. But yeah, that set me up well for university. And then the four years I spent in Edinburgh, my undergraduate was, was here in Edinburgh. I loved that. Uh, I was best friends at my, fr my mate Mark's wedding, who was, um, who was from Northern Ireland. We met at university in the first year here in Edinburgh. Um, and that was just at the weekend there. So the connections I made there were really strong. Um, but that, yeah, I, I kind of at the end of university, I guess at that point I was thinking about, I didn't really have a career path up until that point. I just followed what I was good at and I was good at physics at school. That led me to, to studying physics at university. You mm -hmm. know, uh, I'd finished university. I thought, right, uh, masters, let's do a masters. And <laughs> I did it in slightly further, like reaching, it was display technology. And then from there it was like, oh. I was on this academic progression and yeah. I don't think I was meant to be or I was happy doing it. I was just comfortable doing it. And that was probably one of my problems back then. I wasn't a risk taker. Okay. Um, but I started my physics PhD. Well, it was, it was more computer science, but it was um, with a really strong physics project. It was light and how light interacts with surfaces. So right. I was modeling that. Um, it was a really nice cross... A genre topic with computer science and physics. So I was I was quite happy where I was with it. Mm -hmm. And and I mean generally speaking, yeah. Would you have gone from there on to become a professor, or would you have been like a Neil deGrasse Tyson, Michio Kaku type? Or <laughs> I don't even know who that is. <laughs> um, where would I have gone? I, I I think I probably would have. More more probably Brian me. I think I don't think I would have finished my PhD, or if I. I would have struggled to. I, I was losing focus. I was losing excitement for what I was doing at that point. Um, had I finished it, I think I was ready for work. <laughs> you know, I was ready to, to enter the workplace. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, at, at, at university, my undergraduate, I was quite focused on. I'd come from a family that we, we didn't have much money. So I was uh, very financially driven at university I was planning on joining one of the big five well, it was the big five at that point it wasn't it's not anymore <laughs> since the, the crash um, uh, I had my eye on I wanted to become a, a consultant of some sort like okay. a business consultant like, uh, I was want to, my ideal company was working for Accenture I was I'd been on these courses with them and uh, I was really kind of set on like oh yeah just move down to London make loads of money you know just be one of those guys that was that was my aim my goal and then I did this um, kind of three month sabbatical at university here and did you study in Edinburgh? Yeah, you did. Yeah, yeah. All right. Did, so yeah. There's an organisation called HELP, um, quite patronising now when you look back on it. It was humanitarian and educational long term aid projects. But they organised these um, placements, I guess you'd call them, over projects overseas. And we, I went to Africa for three months and uh, we built a library. It was a construction project. Uh, but it really just changed my attitude. I, was, I went to Africa expecting to go and stay in a hotel with a bath. and. Uh, it wasn't like that. <laughs> it was a, it's different to here, you know, and mm -hmm. you don't realise that until you go. Yeah. And, and then um, my, my point of view changed at that point. And that's maybe why I knew I didn't want to go down that road anymore, but I didn't know what I want to do. So I was on this academic road and I just, I think I was on it because it was easy. Mm. And um, I guess I hadn't, I wasn't ready for anything else at that point. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's where I was. I was probably... A um, bit of a lost soul at that point. Uh, I was quite fit though. You know, I cycled six miles and back to Head 8 Watt, which was where my PhD was every day. I was playing Gee. football. I was in um, good shape back then, but um, I, wasn't, I wasn't ready for a career in academia, <laughs> let's say that. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, how did the opportunity to become part of faking it come about? Right, so the computer science department were playing the maths department at football. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right, this is where it all started. Uh, it was probably the 85th minute and uh, I was one all and I was making a, a dash down the right wing because I always found that if you run really fast in the last few minutes, no one else really chases after you. <laughs> so I was finding that my lungs and I was mm. running down and I got incredibly badly tackled by a mathematician. 
and uh, injured the ligaments in my right ankle. And I was off my feet, I wasn't able to cycle, I wasn't playing football, and I was probably just in front of my, my PC, I didn't have a laptop at the time, in front of my PC, and I read this email that had arrived from the Institute of Physics, which is like a group membership body for, for physicists. There's probably membership bodies for doctors or nurses or teachers or whatever. It was one of those, but for physics. Mm -hmm. And it was Einstein week, and they were celebrating it, and I remember that quite clearly. Oh, Einstein week, interesting. And I read through all the celebrations they were having for Einstein week. This may be a surprise to your, 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 your listenership, your viewership. Yeah. There is Einstein week, it happens. Uh, but right at the bottom was an advert for a reality TV show called Faking It, and it was on Channel 4, I was aware of it. And they were looking for physicists to be part of the show. And I was like, oh, wow, this is fascinating. I love faking it. I'd loved faking it. This was a TV show that was very different to um, Big Brother, uh, yeah. where they kind of humiliated you publicly for six weeks and paid you a few hundred pounds. Um, it taught you a skill, you know. Mm. And this for me was really, really interesting. I'd seen these episodes where they'd taken someone on this four-week training course. They'd given them, they'd, they'd chose the three best teachers in the world, or at least in the UK, to teach them a new skill. And then they test them at the end. And I thought, oh, you know, I... I like the sound of that. That sounds really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I looked at it and the deadline was like in two days time and I said, like, oh, okay, I'll write them an email. So blah, blah, blah. Hi, my name's Kevin. Uh, you know, and, and I made it quite quirky. You know, I like, uh, I like the smell of the grass on, on a spring morning. Um, <laughs> I uh, <laughs> I hate daddy long legs with legs missing. Um, th stuff like this, you know, yeah. kind of wacky stuff. And must have been, looking back, kind of Sheldon-esque, I would say. Hmm. If you're a big Bang Theory fan, it was a bit kind of weird. Um, <laughs> but, but true, all true. And I sent that off to them. And they were like, oh, great, you sound, um, you sound interesting. Can you make us a video? And I was like, right, a video. Okay, and, and I wasn't, you know, you've got quite a, you, you won't yeah. be able to see this, You're, yeah, but you've got quite a good, an amazing setup here. There's lights, there's three sets of lights, seven different cameras, <laughs> eight, in fact. Um, I didn't have any experience in this, but my friend Andy, a physicist friend of mine, he was into making short videos. And I said, sort of, Andy, I want to apply for faking it, you know, the TV shows. Oh, yeah. And he goes, they want a short film. Um, and can you help? And he's like, yeah, yeah. And, he, and they said, have they given you any guidelines? I said, not really. But uh, they want, they want, um, they're looking for a physicist. And my mate Andy, he nailed it. He goes, well, if they want a physicist, let's give them a physicist, <laughs> all right? So, <laughs> and, you know, I sh I like everything, I shaved everything off apart from my moustache. I gave myself a moustache, got the, bow the shirt, bow tie on, put a woolly jumper on top of that so the bow tie was sticking at the top. I uh, had these big circular glasses. They went on, um, side parting, whoosh, um, got my violin out, you know, so we, we did everything. The character of the physicist Brilliant. was created. Yeah. And we made this video and we look back on it thinking, oh, it's hilarious. They're, they're, uh, they're going to love this. But they took it all quite seriously. <laughs> this was a reflection on who I was. Um, I was showing them a really jumper connection and all this sort of stuff. Anyway, so we sent that off. They loved this and it asked me down to London, went down for an interview back and forth, they said, they came up to Edinburgh and said, look, we really want you to be part of the show. And I was like, oh, brilliant, that was great. And I was like, um, so what is it? What am I doing? What will I be doing? And they're like, magic. And I'm like, magic, oh, I love magic. <laughs> and they were like, oh, yeah, yeah, great. And I said, right, is there, and they said, is there anything you wouldn't have done? I said, well, I wouldn't have, you know, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been like a male stripper or anything like that. You know, I'm just not, I'm not built for that. But, you know, magic, I can, I can see how that would work. <laughs> And um, and that was it. That and I had to take time off my PhD. My supervisor wasn't too happy, but we made it work. And then uh, that was four weeks that changed my life. I came back to Edinburgh after it had finished. Took a few days off work, and then went in and decided to to cease uh, the PhD and and become a magician. Really? Yeah. Wow. No, so, so I mean, for for people that that you know Excuse didn't me, see it or aren't familiar with. Um, faking it. I mean, yeah. you you were I mean, you put through an intensive course. I know that certainly you received sort of training and mentorship from Penn and Teller, which in itself yeah. is absolutely astonishing. Oh yeah, the, the, the faking it process is quite remarkable. Um, it was a really high budget reality TV show, so the most of it was done in, down in London. I had three teachers. Uh, one was called Nigel Mead, who's a 
a London magician. The second guy was sadly no longer with us. His name was Patrick Page. Now he is uh, an amazing, was an amazing magician. Everyone in the magic world, who's anyone who's done stuff in magic, will know of Patrick. Will will have maybe worked with him, um, and will have nothing but kind and loving words to to say. He worked with a lot of the big magicians in, in his day. He was from Dundee. And okay. the final magician was a woman called Mandy Moodin, who's a really hilarious comedy magician. Uh, and they were all wonderful, amazing teachers. And they were the core of, uh, of this process in the United Kingdom, in the UK. So that process was, you know, it wasn't just about learning magic. It was bringing me out of my shell, talking to strangers. The first task was they, they, took, they took me out to, uh, to the, is it the Tate Modern, and uh, sat me outside of it. And I had to go up to, I had to stand on the street and point at things and then try and do it with enough um, gusto or belief to convince passers-by, strangers, to, to follow my gaze and look. <laughs> and it was a really weird thing to do because I felt it was hard because I, I, it was, it was um, well, it was insincere. It wasn't, I wasn't pointing at something that was actually there. I was doing it just to guide their attention, which is a very much the foundation of magic yeah. in a lot of ways. So yeah. I was on the street, <laughs> just <laughs> trying to sort of softly point at something, and people were just completely ignoring me and had to go through this whole process of... So they started me off there, they put me in the grading position, like they gave me, they just threw me on stage in a comedy club and said, right, go, you know. <laughs> Shit, yeah. you know, or yeah. they took me to bars and made me chat up women I'd never met before. Really? Um, and this whole thing, they gave me a makeover, you know, they stylized me. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, I don't even want to say this on camera, but uh, I'm embarrassed to say, I think this is one of the t-shirts they got me 12 <laughs> years ago. You know, I, I wasn't ready for this interview, but I'll say I shouldn't have said that. My wife will kill me if she watches this back. Um, <laughs> But yeah, that was the whole process. And then towards the, it was maybe a week and a half left. They said, um, "Have you heard of? Uh, have you ever been to America before?" And I was like, "No, no, never. I've never been over." And I heard of two guys called Penn and Teller. I was like, "Yeah, you know, I think I have. I think they, they did all like they not tell you how the things work." And I was like, "Yeah, yeah." And he goes, "Oh, we're going to go over, and you're going to meet them, and they're going to teach you how to do some tricks." I'm like, "What? That's amazing. It's mm. great. I was just so excited." Um, takes a lot to get me excited as well. So we did that, we went over to LA, you know, we did the whole five hours in acute customs, you know, it hasn't changed. I was in LA just a few weeks ago, it's still the same. I think they would have, you know, put more people on. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I arrived and we met Penn and Teller and it was wonderful, I had to do a trick in front of them. Sadly, the night before, I feel like I was set up a little bit, but they gave me a free reign the night before and, I, and I'd never been to a casino before. I went out, it was 5 a.m., I was drinking, Probably at that time I was smoking, I was playing blackjack, I remember I fell into a fountain. A man had just got back to my room, the next morning we were meeting Penn and Teller. I had to deliver a performance and I was not prepared. So, I mean, they got what they wanted, you know. <laughs> they got their great piece of failure TV mo moment where I messed up in front of Penn and Teller. Um, but then they taught me how to do something. and. That trick was what <clears throat> I used in the final test against. So the, the, final, the thing with faking it at the end of this four weeks, they don't just put you on this journey, they give you a test at the end and they ask you to demonstrate your new skill in front of a panel of expert judges and they have to decide if you're the real deal, mm -hmm. a professional, someone that's been doing it for years or if you're the fake, the phony, the person that picked up in a few weeks. Mm -hmm. So the judge I had to convince at the time was Paul Daniels, again sadly no longer with us. Um, who, if you don't know who Paul Daniels is, because I, I realise a lot of people now don't. If you're, if you're, if you're, um, oh. so I'm 37, but if you're younger than say mid 30s, you've probably never heard of him. But he was the most famous magician in the UK at the time, a real legend mm. in the magic world. And I had to convince him I was a magician. I managed to do that. Uh, I convinced all three judges. So I was one of the few people that managed to uh, to f completely fake it. And I was really elated. I was on a bit of a high. I still hadn't crossed my mind that I was going to stop doing physics. But I did have a massive high. And this four-week adventure had come to an end. And, and that was, yeah, that was, um, it was weird coming back to Edinburgh, going back to Harriet Watt, sitting at my desk, trying to get my head around, you know, a, a torch shining off a surface, you know, and measuring 
and writing code to model all these situations. It was really difficult to get my head back into this, so I did mm -hmm. take another day or two off, and it was after that that I thought, you know, I just, I can't go on with this anymore. I, I don't think this is what I meant, this is how I meant to spend my life, you know. I, I didn't feel it was right, and I thought, I've not got any commitments, um, I've not got a mortgage, I've not got kids, and let's see what happens with magic. So <coughs> that was that was probably at the start of December 2004, so quite some time ago now, and uh, I, hadn't, I told my brother and my sisters, and we had this really hilarious Christmas dinner where uh, my mum and dad didn't know, but my, my brothers and sisters kept on dropping hints <laughs> during like, we were all home for Christmas, like, oh yeah, so how's the PhD going, Kev? And I'm like, oh yeah, it's going, it's going all right. I hadn't <laughs> built up the courage to tell my parents. Um, <laughs> I decided to leave the, uh, you know, the 12 years of physics and, and start doing something else. Jeez. But that happened, um, and my mum and dad, again, I don't know, to their credit, they were surprised, yeah, but they're so supportive. They just, they've got a real belief in me, you know, and I think they just mm. felt that whatever I'd set my mind to, I would be able to make a go of, and uh, that wasn't, at the time, that was not gonna be physics. And things have changed since then. I suppose we'll talk about that later. Mm -hmm. But I felt, at that point, I have to just completely distance myself from that, because now I am a magician. This is me, I'm gonna, <laughs> do magic, and that was me, I'd, I'd changed. Wow, that's incredible. So, I mean, you, you must have, I suppose, like the sort of existential crisis of, oh, I'm doing physics, this isn't probably the thing I want to do, okay, I'm gonna do magic, mm. but how long did it take you to become comfortable with being a magician? Oh, gosh. Um, it's weird. How long did it take me to become? I think I was proud to start with. You know, I I didn't see any, I wasn't like, oh, you know, talking to my mates, and, oh, I'm a magician now, you know. I was like, oh, this is me, this mm -hmm. is what I do now. Hmm. So I think I was probably overly comfortable in being a magician, having only had four weeks training, um, you know, I guess you're not going to put someone in front of uh, the surgeon's table and have them do open heart surgery after four weeks. You know, you're not going to do that. And really, it's it's not fair to say. I, I don't think I was a magician at that point. Mm -hmm. I could do some tricks. Hmm. And I had a likable personality. And I was on the right path. I had great mentors, you know. Yeah. Great kick into the, the world of magic. Um, but... I wasn't, I probably wasn't a magician then, but I was saying I was. And, uh, but a lot of people, other people, other magicians were saying, you know, you're, you know, they were, they, they were thinking, you're not really a magician. Uh, and I kind of suffered from that a little bit. You know, I remember I got, a, so I, I didn't, and I mean, you can't just instantly start making a career or make money as a magician. You just, that doesn't happen. You have to, I didn't know what to do at that point. Mm -hmm. So although I was, <coughs> excuse me, um, saying I was a magician, I wasn't really out working. I got my first job in a TGI Friday's restaurant in Glasgow. So every Friday night I was in there, um, got paid like 100 quid or something, and going around tables doing tricks for three hours. Uh, but 30, you know, 33 pound an hour was more than I'd ever learned, earned up until that point. So I was quite happy thinking, yeah, you know, if I could just do eight hour shifts, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, could, you could work out that, ah, actually, I'm, that's a graduate salary. <laughs> but it was only for three hours a week. 120 pound wasn't, wasn't massive money. Um, it was 120, not 100. Um, so I was tutoring maths and physics at the time. I was high school uh, tuition. But that was, again, that was only really, you know, really it was, started in December um, through to me when the parents, you know, when started getting worried about the prelim results. <laughs> um, so I got a job in a restaurant and I remember, I, I mean, it's not, the, it's a large chain restaurant. It's not the most prestigious one to work at. And I remember when I, when I started that job and I was um, serving a customer and 
someone had recognised me and I was just mortified and I just couldn't go back. I just wanted to hide in the kitchen, you know, I was just like, I can't go back out. And my manager's like, what? why not? And he was just so proud <coughs> to work for this restaurant. And I just can't, I just, I don't want to, like that person, they didn't, they were, you know, I'd taken their order and they were just, you know, they were looking and they were thinking and they were lost. Like, and they were like, I know this, you know, they were like, I know this guy. And I just saw the moment where they realised who I was and I just felt like I'd, I really let them down because mm-hmm. the way the faking it show had finished was they'd come back and they'd done a, look, Kevin's a magician now. But I mean, okay, I was performing once a, one day a week at TGI Fridays, but uh, I wasn't earning a salary. It was, mm-hmm. it was difficult, it was hard. I was eking out a living through magic, through tutoring, through working in a restaurant. and. Uh, so that was a real difficult moment for me. And I'm just trying to think now, how long? So I worked for that restaurant for 18 months and it was McDonald's, I might as well just say it. Uh, it's hard for me to look back on it. I'd worked as Mc- in McDonald's as a student, so it wasn't too bad for me, but um, it was really, it was, so th- I remember magicians found out that I was working there and I just felt, that moment, it was low. That was more. There was a low moment for me where I was thinking, I'm not getting enough money for magic, and tutorings. This isn't the season for tutoring, and I was just like, I don't know what to do. And a year had gone by since the faking it thing had finished, so it's mm-hmm. probably if that was December. It would have probably been early 2006. And I was like, right, I'm going to apply to be a physics teacher. I'm just going to do teaching. I'll start. I'll do that. I've got friends that are teachers. They love it. Oh. And I met my mate John, my mate John from Resyth and Fife, who left school when he was, you know, as soon as he could, 16, started working for Carpetwise. He worked his way up to the, you know, as far as he could go, really go, really. He was running lots of different Carpetwise stores. And, you know, he'd done really well for himself. It's a bit of a guy, you know, and he'll forgive me for saying his, his skills were in education. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't good at passing exams like I was, but he was really good at getting what he wanted from people. <laughs> so he was a great manager, you know. He was one of these people, a real people person. He could get you to do what, that was what his skill was. So you could mm-hmm. see why he progressed so quickly up the chain in this company. And he was like, Kev, like, what? going to do like what the fuck are you doing and I was just, like, what what do you want to do what you and he gave me a talking to he can't even remember giving me this talking to he probably gives it to his staff all the time and then I was like right okay you're right I'll keep on doing this and that's when I decided to do my first friend's show that was in 2006 I just um things started picking up with work with the magic and I felt like I could see a way forward mm-hmm. and so I quit my job in the restaurant and uh, later that year and had my first Fringe show, um, I think, was it around then? Yeah, that's when I, 2000, I did the New York Marathon that year. Uh, there was a few things, that I'd, I think it was around that time when my mate gave me a talking to, I woke up and I was like, what, what am I doing this year? I'm doing a Fringe show, I'm gonna run the New York Marathon. And I just made a few things, I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to do a marathon. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was like, I'll just do Edinburgh. But my mate, this is another mate of mine, Gary was saying, Ke- kidding me Kev? How many marathons are you going to do in your fucking life? And I'm like, probably one. He goes, if you're going to do a fucking marathon, we're doing the fucking New York, we're doing the biggest oh, marathon gee. ever, we're doing New York. It's like, all right, okay. <laughs> so I get sucked into these schemes. Forgive the language. Am I allowed to swear? Of course, yeah, yeah. So that's how, that's how the conversation went, quite literally. And then, so that year I was doing the fringe, I was doing the marathon, and, and I became a magician. That's when I feel like I became a magician. It was a year, yeah. and, a, it was a year and nine months later. That's when I felt like, okay, that's now I'm a magician. <laughs> what is your your style of um, magic now, and and I suppose what was kind of the the, the path as to becoming what you are now? Uh, it's, this is an ongoing. Like, <laughs> yeah. I was with my, I have a mentor, an older magician that I go to for. We're, we're constantly talking about this, and every sh- every show I do is a. To, um, I discover something more about myself and where I should go and mm-hmm. often I find myself doing things that aren't me and it takes me usually to be on stage in front of an audience to be delivering a line before I know that. So Kevin Quantum um, was a decision I made a few years ago. I, I, I found myself looking for who am I, you know, doing some self-exploration and thinking, what am I? What makes me interesting and different from all the other magicians? I, <clears throat> so 
just put the, let's put this in context. So 10 years, I'd been doing magic for 10 years. I'd quickly become um, a, a good close-up magician in two years. I was working in restaurants, I was working in bars, I was doing weddings, private parties, I was going to um, wedding shows and picking up loads of work. I mean, I was going to a wedding fair and picking up 20 or 30 bookings in a weekend. I was, uh, I had a really honed system for doing it, I had a great stall, I was, hi you know, I was hiring people to work with me to get more bookings, you know. Mm. I'd, and off the back of these three wedding fairs mm. I'd done in Glasgow, I built a whole career of private work. Um, and <clears throat> but the, my incomes had kind of plateaued and I was earning reasonably good money for eight years. Um, certainly uh, more, more than kind of what my graduate friends were making. And you know, I was kicking back, you know, I was spending Monday to Friday, I'd bought my own flat, you know, I'd, I was doing all, I'd save for deposit, you know, even back then I could, you know, on, as a magician, you know, I could, uh, you could do this if you were, and my, my kind of what I was good at was marketing and um, I had a familiarization with how, how Google and AdWords work. So mm -hmm. I was like, no one, I was top of the list for magician, whatever you put in, magician, whatever city. I was, you know, for two pence, I clicked. <laughs> I was there. No one else knew how to do it. Oh, nice. So I was getting, I was, and then suddenly some other guys realized how to do this. And then we built this cartel. And um, so we were cornering the market for gigs and we had a, a, a Google spreadsheet. Again, we were really way ahead of our time. We'd shared our diaries with each other, so we always knew where we were working. This, and this was mid 2000s, you know, this, is, <laughs> this was groundbreaking back then. I wish we'd, <laughs> uh, and we would then, if I was working, I'd see who was available and I would, with that amazingly glowing recommendation, tell the client, this is the guy you need to hire. He's probably, if it wasn't me, this this is the next best guy. He's really good. You're, you're going to love him. Your mum's going to love him. Your dad's going to love him. You know, there was a whole glowing room. So we <laughs> kind of had this market corn. But as, as I say before, um, income was stagnant and kind of felt like I hit a glass ceiling. I wasn't going anywhere. I was comfortable and I was mm -hmm. in that position again. I was in maybe seven or eight years prior to that. So this was a... Uh, so at that point, who was Kevin? He was a really good close-up magician, incredibly likable, uh, very malleable. I could go into any situation and like a chameleon adapt to the audience I was performing to, mm -hmm. um, whether it was in a miner's bar in Fife or whether it was a high-end corporate function in uh, Glen Eagles, whether it was a footballer's wedding, uh, whether it was for a, an old family with... Uh, with a big house and with uh, with money, I, I felt I was really able to adapt. I'd come, fr I studied in Edinburgh. I was, I was maybe from what maybe you'd call a working class background, but I was, and I maybe had confidence in myself because I knew what I'd done and accomplished academically. So I was able yeah. to go. In. So that's who I was then, and then I started exploring stage magic more. I got together with a group of guys, and we started doing this comedy sketch magic show called The Color Ham. Mm. And very much there, Kevin the Magician was a submissive character. Um, he was, which is an unusual, very unusual character for a magician to have. Much more, it has to be commanding and powerful. And, and to be a submissive magician is, is difficult to, to pull off. But it worked well within the context of the Colour Ham because it wasn't a magic show. It was a comedy show with special effects. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and Gav was, was by far and away the comedian. So Gavin, I mentioned, uh, should to give me his full name, is Gavin Oates, um, a really good friend of mine. We met, um, <laughs> gosh, where did we meet? He was a friend of Co this guy called Colin that I met, who was this young chubby kid that did mind reading. And <laughs> he's not anymore, he's like a sort of sex idol <laughs> and, uh, you know, body beautiful and America's Got Talent semi-finalist, yeah. uh, doing amazing things with his career, but uh, Colin, uh, I'm sure you'll see the funny side of that. <laughs> and we, anyway, he was working for Gavin at Gavin's company, Tree of Knowledge, and they were doing really interesting, inspirational, it was like motivational talking for children. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what, mm -hmm. what's that all about? And, <laughs> and it, but they were really into it. And they went, we want to inspire the world. It was all this kind of happy <laughs> incense stuff. That's exactly, yeah. Yeah, and Gav, I mean, to this day, give him credit, he stuck to that mantra, inspire the mm -hmm. world is still what Tree of Knowledge do. It's, it's a great, uh, great ambition to have. I don't have that. What am I in three words thing? I don't. I just don't have it. I just. I, I feel I'm more kind of like on a merry-go-round. Oh gosh, who's that American comedian? I just don't want to get. I'm on this merry-go-round. I just don't know when it's going to stop. I don't want to get off. Just keep on going round and round and round. 
Um, and it'll come to me later. So yeah, we all got together. We started doing comedy magic, or sketch comedy magic, which was a really interesting genre to start playing with. So we were building um, these really funny seven or eight minute vignettes where um, Colin was kind of the straight man, mind reader. Uh, I was the kind of kind of naive magician where things would happen. I'd be quite surprised. Oh gosh, <laughs> my thumb. Where's my thumb? Oh, oh yeah, <laughs> sorry. No, I was playing that character. And Gav was just this kind of glake uh, completely oblivious to everything apart from his view of the world. And it's just hilarious point of view of the world. And, and, have, and we created some really, really great sketches. Like, um, <clears throat> we, uh, we could have made it. I really genuinely believe that had we, can been, had we, had we stuck at it for longer, had we... Um, had I, you know, not become a, f you know, this weird, life gets in the way, you know, mm -hmm. I became a dad around the time we were doing our second big Fringe run. It was a really, really difficult year for me. My wife gave birth between the Magic Festival and the Fringe. Uh, so <clears throat> looking back, it was just bad timing, uh, but we, we came up with such great work. Really, really funny stuff, really amazing stuff. I mean, we used to, on our flyers, say we want to, uh, blow your brains whilst you shit yourself laughing. It was, <laughs> you know, we rock your socks off, uh, rock your shoes off, and you won't even have to take off your socks. Rock your socks off, you won't even have to take off your shoes. God, forgive <laughs> me. Uh, it was really funny, high energy, silly stuff with a real Scottish uh, nature to it. Gav mm -hmm. was from the west, I was from the east. Colin was from right in the middle of Heart Hill. Kind mm -hmm. of all worked, uh, but sadly, that's not. Uh, it's not happening anymore. Uh, Gav's business grew. Uh, Colin started experiencing success as a solo artist. And I guess at that point, my career wasn't just performing magic. I'd met my, my wife. I was married at this point. Mm -hmm. And she just graduated from um, Napier University's festivals and events program. Very ambitious young woman. Um, Svetlana, my wife, she's from Moscow. She studied at a really prestigious theater school in Russia. Um, uh, how old are you, Elliot? Do you remember? I'm 34. 34. Do you remember um, uh, a girl band called Tattoo? Um, <sighs> Russian. Uh, running through my head, running through my head, running through my head, running through. They had this one single, and it was really a big hit from when I. If you had someone, give two, maybe a year or two older than you, ask them who Tattoo were, they'll remember this yeah. Russian double act. And it was, you know, it was wet t-shirts and young, uh, you know, sexy 18-year-old Russian girls. <laughs> so as a 16-year-old Scot, I was like, whoa, these, these guys are good, you know. Anyway, everyone knew who they were. But these girls were not just, um, they were trained at a very prestigious school. And uh, so Svetlana was in the same circle as, as these girls, as other, kind of, she knows these, the kind of recurrent crop of the Russian language, theater, dance, and television. She, she's familiar or knows them or has just one step away from this. She, she, what I'm trying to say is she, was, she took a big jump. She came over here because she loved festivals and events and Edinburgh is the place to study that. She left and mm -hmm. she was really ambitious. We got together. I was in magic, she was in festivals and events, and we thought, this was like 2009, late 2009, we thought, right, let's, uh, let's do a festival, let's do a magic festival, and let's do it here in Edinburgh. I mean, J.K. Rowling, she wrote Harry Potter, she was inspired. Edinburgh's mm -hmm. such a magical city. Mm -hmm. There's no other magic festival in Scotland, and the magic festivals in the UK are, um, aren't really magic festivals, they're more industry events. Mm -hmm. So we started our own, and that was, that was a, another massive part of my career, which is, still a huge part of my life now. Um, so my festival was growing, Gavin's business was growing, Colin was having success with his solo career, and we, we sort of split up. So at that point, I was very much a comedy magician, I still am. Um, I think I'm quite funny, um, generally speaking, from a bird's eye point of view. <laughs> most people would agree. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, well, I'm oh, good gauging by my, my Twitter feed. Uh, and I'm not funny like I can write jokes, but I'm really good in situation. I'm, I'm really good at creating funny situations. That's my talent, okay. building a situation, and then uh, with with people from the audience, and then using and using that to to everyone's advantage. And uh, so, I mean, your earlier question was, what kind of magician? I, that's this is a journey I went on through close up magic comedy, and then this <coughs> Kevin Quantum was in a more at the start certainly was a maybe more austere, a bit more intellectual, 
uh, highbrow, more bit more command. But at the same time, he, he had this kind of mad scientist, not kind of not kind of completely present with everyone else, a wee bit somewhere else. Um, <clears throat> we're still working on Kevin Quantum, but he's gone through a few incarnations. The <laughs> first the first show was very exploratory. Quantum Magic was really it was Kevin McMahon and that was it was before Kevin Quantum. Then uh Illuminations, so Kevin Quantum happened in 2016. Illuminations was uh a show all about light and this is where Kevin Quantum started really with Illuminations and that was a real difficult work for me. That was um, it was theatre and magic. I wanted to try and do storytelling with magic, mm -hmm. which is so difficult. And I didn't mm. pitch it right, and I <clears throat> probably didn't have the skills. Um, but still, you know, well received, um, mixed reviews, I would say, but uh, very well received, well attended. Um, and the second incarnation of Illuminations was a huge success uh, on tour. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's, so what am I now? Well, now it's magic with a science flavor to it. Um, first and foremost, so the, the shows I've done recently, Illuminations was a study on light. You know, I was trying to find sh magic tricks that were light based. I was trying to way, find a way to bring magic and light science together. Um, like we did some amazing science on that. So some great R&D, we built a rainbow from scratch. Probably the world's first ever indoor proper rain, rainbow, theatrical rainbow, to the best of my knowledge. Um, people, you can create them, you know, with a, a sprinkler and sunlight, but to do that indoors is really difficult. So we, you know, I was solving second order differential equations, trying to work out where to position the, the it's been a long time since I had to solve <laughs> these equations, but trying to find out where to position the lights, what angle, because we weren't using water, we were using something else, like a kind of sand. <clears throat> it was great work. Um, but didn't really play theatrically very well. Um, it was more akin to like an early 1900 science demonstration, but a couch in a theatre show. Mm. So I, I was very self-indulgent. I was showing things that I wanted to show people. You know, I was kind of about me and stuff that I'd invented that I wanted to show people. <laughs> uh, but the magic was so ambitious. We were flying, <clears throat> we were making stuff float above people's heads, uh, which, you, you really, you shouldn't be doing outside of a West End theatre or a theatre in Vegas where you have complete control of your environment. Mm -hmm. I was taking huge risks with material that uh, wasn't 100%. And um, we were talking earlier about, um, you, your viewers can't see this, but you've got a second camera as a backup for every other camera that you've got positioned. <laughs> I had no backups on everything. And I was doing very technical, technological magic and with no backups and this is a recipe for problems encountering mm. problems and before I would go on stage every day I was you know I was invisible thread and setting up things above the audience I was hanging 120 kilograms of sand above a stage I was mm. positioning seven different torches and, and lights in different positions it's an incredibly stressful setup um, <coughs> And I had 15 minutes because the fringe is like that. You have 15 minutes to do all this. The, the most magical thing about that show, looking back, was how I managed to do the setup in mm. such a short space of time. <sighs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> it was a difficult. But like I said, it, from that, I went to Australia on tour to Australia for six weeks. That was just earlier this year. I took Illuminations and it was such a hit. Mm. It was a huge hit out there. We rewrote it, restructured it, re-engineered it kind of from the top down, to use a phrase I don't really understand, um, or that shouldn't be used outside of uh, corporate speak. Um, <laughs> it's a top down approach. <laughs> um, we restructured it and we made something that was, that was really good. And, uh, and I started to find, start to feel who I was and that process is still ongoing and I made big strides again this year. That's, that's fascinating because I mean you've been doing it now for for a, you know a considerable amount of time and uh, I, I suppose it's probably part of a continual evolution and development of who you are and, and what you do yes oh, yeah, absolutely yeah it's yeah. <clears throat> you don't unless you're really lucky I'm always envious of these people that when they're five I want to be a doctor and then suddenly they're on this and then boom university 
boom, five years done, boom, junior, yeah. senior yeah. consultant. You know, <laughs> suddenly they're a specialist. And like from five, they knew what they wanted to do. They just knew. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. Is life really exciting or really boring for you? I mean, <laughs> what does it feel like to be like that? Because I just don't know. Mm. I don't know. I'm <laughs> constantly questioning everything. I don't know. Who I, last night, again, sat down just thinking, what, who am I? What kind of things can I do? And I'm a bit more forthright now and saying that material is not right for me. We shouldn't work on that. That script, I just don't feel comfortable saying that because, well, to be honest, I'm, I'm saying that um, the world is different from how I know it scientifically to be. You know, I can't, I can't say that this is a, an access to a parallel universe because... <laughs> It's not, and it's patronising for me to say, stand on stage and say that. I need to find a way of, of still finding a, a way of taking the magic and the science and, and bringing them together. It's difficult, I really struggle, because <clears throat> magic and science, when I embarked upon this, I didn't realise how difficult it was really going to be. Um, one of the thought experiments I like to tell my audience is that I sat down and I wrote the word magic into Microsoft Office. I was writing an essay about magic and I needed a synonym because I was just using the word magic way too much. Right clicked, synonym, list of synonyms appear, illusion, you know, misdirection, wonder, enchantment, all that sort of stuff. Right at the bottom you have the antonym, the opposite word, and the opposite word for magic was science. <laughs> I was like, oh, holy shit, <clears throat> that's really cool. These things are opposites. I should write this into my script, you know. <laughs> <Right enough. laughs> there I was, <laughs> scripting away. Uh, I thought, I'll just reverse the process. And I thought, all right, science, right click, antonym. Ignorance. Hmm. Ergo, <laughs> no, magic equals ignorance. This was the, the equation that you, yeah. if you just follow this through, um, which was really interesting. To, you know, according to Microsoft and Bill Gates, Microsoft <laughs> has said that mag magic equals ignorance. And yeah, I guess... You can make an argument for that, but it's so much more as well. I, it's, I think to be ignorant, you have to, to be, first of all, be a sentient being, you know, and, uh, and that's really at the heart of magic. To be, to appreciate magic, you need to, on the audience side, you need to be able to, uh, to disconnect. First of all, you need to know the rules of the world to understand that they're being broken. <laughs> and then uh, for, you also need, and the other, this is the other thing I learned, and you, you may think I'm crazy, and, but it's taken me so long to learn this, but you need a magician on stage doing the magic. You need a focal point. You need a person of ability, of magical ability to be doing tricks for you. Mm. Otherwise, it's not magic anymore. Yeah. And <laughs> that took me, you know, a, a four weeks at the fringe and, you know, six weeks of, six months of development to, to understand this and someone could have told me that five years ago yeah of course that makes but you don't know it until you until you know it yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> that sounds so stupid doesn't it <laughs> but uh, that's how I learn it's uh, unfortunately I'm a trial and error learner uh, it's just how I'm built I need to make yeah. mistakes I just mm -hmm. someone it's very hard for me to sit and listen to someone I need to actually put my hand in the fire and be burned and, and even then yeah. I think maybe that was a one-off <laughs> <laughs> What if I do it with this hand? Oh shit, it's still, you know, I'm, I'm that kind of st stupid guy uh, in a lot of respects. I, I, can, I can really relate to that actually, definitely. <laughs> yeah. So given where you are now, I mean, wh yeah. where do you kind of go from here? You know, what, what does your future look like? <clears throat> yeah, so um, after the Colour Ham finished, uh, Magic Fest is ticking along. We briefly mentioned legacy earlier off camera and Magic Fest for me is, is a legacy thing. It's weird because I'm trying to pull back from it now. I don't want to be running it. My wife's taken over uh, a, a massive chunk of running Magic Fest because I, it was taking up way too much of my time. Like six months a year I was on Magic Fest wow. and it left me very little time to be what I wanted. Why I got into Magic was not to be an event organiser, mm. but I found myself being a really good event organiser. and like, I don't want to be an event organiser. Uh, I want to be a magician. So two years ago, I want to stop doing, stop relying on weddings and work where, this is a really hard thing to explain, but magicians will get bored of the material. If I'm doing a gig, a close-up gig, I'm expected to do maybe 20 or 30 performances to different groups of people. 
and you can bet your bottom dollar I'll be repeating the same two or three tricks 20 or 30 times. If I do four gigs a week, I'm doing those tricks 120 times a weekend. You take that over a year, well, it's easier to multiply that by 100, that's 120. So that's 6,000 times a year that I'm doing the same tricks. I, six, th I mean, that gets boring, you know? Mm. And, and even the, the, the buzz and the drug you get, the adrenaline rush from seeing people appreciate wonder wears off. And I was getting bored and I wasn't earning more money. And I thought, what am I, I need to change what I'm doing. So I decided to become, to change my business model completely and stop doing these weddings and parties and corporate events. And I wanted to make money from someone going into a theater and saying, there's 20 pounds, I'm going to see Kevin Quantum. There's my ticket, I'm proud to say that. Uh, two years and a year, a year into that, I remember like I was the most skint I've been since, you know, 10 years previous to that when I quit my restaurant. Uh, I remember like taking my account, my tax return to my accountant and he was like saying, you know, you, you're going to get a bit of a windfall from the tax man because you massively over, they may flag this, you know, that um, your earnings have, have dropped by over 50%. And they may wow. think you're taking the piss here. I'm like, this is just what happened, you know, I'm, I'm trying to make this work. Um, but from then, um, I've just been in this really wonderful position now where the lines, suddenly the lion's share of my income is now from people wanting to go and see my show. I'm not being booked just to tick the magician box on an event planner's list. I'm not just this guy that interrupts you whilst you're having a drink with your friends or eating your dinner which is really soul destroying after a while. Even though I got really good at it, it's hard. I'm a guy that stands there in my space, my environment, and people come to me to watch what I do. And mm -hmm. it's, from a performance point of view, so much more satisfying. Uh, and I managed to get there through taking a lot of risks with my, my, kind of like my livelihood. Um, so I'm in a position now where, uh, so Illuminations was, for me, although despite its problems, was a bit of a breakthrough show, throw for me. It should really proved to me what I could do. It did really well in Australia, it won awards over there. I mean, and that was only like, fuck, I mean, nine months ago that I've started to have this kind of success. <laughs> the tour went really well. So uh, literally last night, we're going back to the two months in Australia next year, um, starting off Perth and Adelaide and then Tasmania. Um, before that, so in the short term future, like my next year is all is, all, is there is already gone. I mean, Gee. I know where I'm going to be for most of it. There's a <laughs> few gaps, but um, so London, my first full evening London show happens on the second of December in Clapham at the Clapham Grand. You know, it's not the poshest part of town. I mean, all of the centre of London now is pretty pretty amazing. Yeah. So I'm really proud about this. So it's a two half show. It's a massive deal for me. I want to really. I'm one of now a few, only a few magicians I think could pull this off. I think, even then, <laughs> you know, I've got a lot of work to do before you know for the six weeks to uh, go. End of December, Magic Fest Christmas special at the Traverse. Uh, we're in the Traverse, amazing theatre to be in. Between Christmas and New Year, we're doing eight shows. We did that for the first time this time last year, so that's a, something that really worked for us, and we expect it to work really well again this year. Um, it just sold so well; everyone loved it. Uh, then we're into January, uh, I'll go back to Moscow and visit Svetlana's family for a bit. And uh, end of January, I'm going to Australia. Family come with me after, I've, so I do two and a half weeks in Perth and they come with me and join me in Adelaide. We know Adelaide quite well now, having been there earlier this year for five weeks. And um, come back after Tasmania, that'll be in March. And I've got a few local tour dates, so I'll probably be doing a few theatres around Scotland. Um, April set aside for get ready for Magic Fest, which is moving to May. <laughs> I'll be doing Comparing the Gala Show, which will be in the Lyceum this year, uh, next year. We'll do three nights there. Again, I love the Lyceum, it's an amazing theatre. Really happy to be back there. Mm -hmm. uh, June, going down to Brighton for the Fringe there, I guess. And then that'll lead me, probably with my new show, that I'll have to develop between mm -hmm. coming back from Magic Festival and the end of May. Uh, probably called Terminal Velocity, not sure yet. I quite like nice. that, I like speed as a concept. And then uh, build up for the fringe. And I'm not, no idea what I'm doing August yet, but I know it'll be a new show. I don't know what venue, I don't know. Um, this year I've done two shows. I don't think I'll do two shows again. I had really great fun with them both. One was out and out comedy magic with a really cool format. The other one was 
more Kevin Quantum, the science magician again. But these two things are coming closer and closer together. Mm. It's, it's really weird now that this quirky uh, Kevin Quantum character <laughs> um, and this Kevin, can it, let's just say Kevin McMahon, the comedy magician, uh, what I found is I'm at my best on stage when, when I'm just, when, when, these, when these are together, you know. We're playing around with different ideas. So that's the next year. The next five years is, uh, well, there's only one, when you break it down, there's only one career progression you can have as uh, in anyone in entertainment, and that is getting what your product, well, let's just talk about business in general, getting your product in front of as many people as possible. That's really what everyone's trying to do, isn't it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> sometimes it's you want the right people, but generally speaking, the more the merrier. So that's what I want to do. I need to replicate myself um, or I need to be um, playing really big theatres. Mm -hmm. So replicating yourself, what does that mean? Well, that means like YouTube, you know, I need to make a thousand, a million copies of me that's constantly working on someone's screen and somewhere in the world. Um, so, you know, replicate myself a million times and then uh, put myself in DVDs and videos on television. Uh, and then usually from that, that leads to then uh, when you, where you make your money is usually live. Um, more people come to see you do your live shows. So the mm -hmm. only way I can consider going just now is developing my live projects, getting bigger, uh, getting more impressive, getting better, just really getting more comfortable on stage and doing work that people want to see that I'm happy with doing. And then, um, well then, you know, crack America. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm laughing, but I, I'm serious when I say that. You really? know, these things aren't, uh, pipe dreams is this plans afoot, you know, and they may be, it's, I was in Vegas um, two weeks ago, I, I left literally just a few hours before a madman decided to stand on the roof of a hotel and murder over 500 people. I was there with my family and your mind races, you know, when, when these things happen, you can have a brief brush with death and all, all the what ifs go through your mind. Mm -hmm. But Vegas is one of the few places in the world where you can go as a magician and live and stay in one place and do your thing, people come to you. There's not very many other places you can do that. I don't want to take my family on the road with me for the rest of my life. I, I don't mm. want to live the life of a circus performer, traveling from city to city. I, it doesn't appeal to me. I, I can just about make it work by doing festivals just now. I, I like the idea of going to one city for six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> that appeals, I can just about make that work. but. Doing a tour is really difficult unless you're, you're doing the playhouse like Darren Brown does or Dynamo does. It's a difficult, it's a hard slog. Yeah. So the only thing I can do is become, is raise my profile. Uh, and that's why, that's the, the, the big goal. That's what it has, that's what I have to do. Otherwise, I'll find myself in five years time thinking, if, if I can't do it, then I'll, I'll need to do something else. Um, maybe in the world of magic, maybe in something else. How important is money to you? Um, it's important enough for, I want, I, my wife and I talk about this sometimes, and I suppose most couples do, but I want to be comfortable. I want my daughter to have a really good education, um, you know, whether that's um, paid for in the state sector, you know, I'm prepared to move house or pay money. I'm happy to do both those things. Uh, and I'm in a position where we can do that. Um, I want to be free of any financial obligations and kind of, kind of are, we're in a lucky position, I, I guess, where, we, let's just say we don't have too many outgoings. <laughs> uh, I don't have much debt to my name. I think the only thing I'd have outstanding is like my student loan, really. Uh, but that's still not enough for me. I want to, I almost want to have enough that I'm, I can, t I can take more risks. Uh, I've, I've, from a really sort of socialist working class background, you know, there's, you're taught not to take risks. And whether that's just through societal evolution that we need a class of people that aren't risk takers to, um, to, to work in jobs where they're not ambitious or um, whether that's social engineered, I, I don't know, right? And I try and stay back from politics now although these things do go through my mind. I come from an upbringing where I wasn't a risk taker and I've had to learn to do that. And you look at 
are, are beyond you and you see successful people, they, they take risks, you know, they, and I, I'm not against that. I will uh, risk almost everything um, in the knowledge that I could start again. You know, I've, I feel comfortable about that now. Mm -hmm. I never used to. <laughs> I used to hold on to everything so dearly. And letting go of the private work and the weddings and that was so difficult. But and it's much better now that, I mean, from, from doing Australia, like, I've been, someone flew me back just for one night. Can you believe it? They flew me back to Australia just for one night to do a show for their company. <laughs> and that one event was like working uh, you know, a couple of months doing private parties here and, and uh, what I used to do. So, but they're, they're rare, you know, they're, they're, but at the same time, it's a much smarter way of working. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not out, you're not spending all your time doing, you, you just, you're upscaling a little bit. Yeah. So, I, I, okay, money's important. Yeah, and money's important to me because of my upbringing, because we never had much when I was younger. And I feel that uh, it's important to me. Um, my wife's got a different mindset. Her father was a really successful businessman. Um, she she's taught me how to be a risk taker. She's taught me how to just, you know, to not get too caught up and concerned about things and just uh, and, and the the menial, the small stuff. Don't get bothered by that and just think big. Think. So I really appreciate her outlook on life, and I still have my, my hang ups, but I feel like I'm better now than I used to be. Um, so it is important, and I don't like letting it go, but at the same time, I'll happily spend a lot to, to uh, uh, like I said, the wolves were at the door last August, I remember before the fringe had finished, and usually uh, it was difficult then, but mm. we, got, we made money in August, and then things happened, and then I fought, you know, to get my break in Australia, it was only after my promoter phoned me and said, I'm really sorry, we, um, we can't get you over there. And I was like, just give me the number. I need to, I need to work and phone in. And, and the knowledge is a, a guest in good stead <clears throat> as a festival director. I know that last minute opportunities appear for whatever reason. And that the people that get those opportunities are the people that uh, want them the most. Yeah. Not needless to say the most deserving, but the people that are, that are there that have said, look, I'm really easy to work with. Mm. Here's my blurb, here's my image. This is what I need, you know, I've got everything ready. All I need is just for you to say yes. <laughs> and that happened in Australia. And a 300 seat theater came up and I sold a lot of tickets. And it's only because I didn't give up when, when someone said it's not gonna happen. I just kept on trying. And it was, that, that, that tour was really, yeah, kind of a, a real, moment in my real kind of one, I think when you reflect, it's really hard in my career because it's not, it's not like, it's, let's go back to the doctor I, uh, idea again, you, you don't have this laid out career path, you don't know where you're going. Mm -hmm. And it's only when you reflect back, you think, oh yeah, that, that was a big moment in my career, that was a big moment. You don't know those moments when you're in them, yeah. you just don't know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I've got a mixed feeling, I'm kind of Jekyll and Hyde on money, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the tightest guy out there, you know, I'll, um, I'll not spend, you know, I'd rather walk home in the freezing cold rather than spend like, six pounds on a taxi. And other times I'm really, like the, the holiday we had in America, I, I didn't want to hold back too much on that. So we spent more than we probably should have done. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm Jekyll and Hyde. Hmm. Like, yeah, I'd, I'll spend for work, definitely. I'd, yeah. I don't really need much myself though. I'm happy to spend five thousand pounds on an illusion, absolutely, <laughs> or thousand pounds on a book that I like. <laughs> yeah, if, if I get the, if I have the money and I really want it, then yeah, I'll do that. But yeah, I'm I'm weird with money. I I can't explain it. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It's important. Yeah, it's not important. Some it's more important sometimes when I've not got much of it. It's important. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then when I've when I'm when I'm comfortable, but I'm all, I've generally most of the time been comfortable. Yeah. So I'm, yeah, I, I can't complain. I'm lucky like that. I know a lot of people aren't, but <laughs> so far so much, so good. Yeah. <laughs> Superstitious as well. <laughs> mm. um, yeah, I've got some, some questions going a, a little bit deeper, uh, okay, I guess. Go for it. The first one um, is around purpose, a kind of life purpose. Um, you know, for yourself, what, what do you kind of feel has been and is your, your, your purpose? I don't know. Um, 
uh, I feel like you've only got one chance and I feel like you, you've really just, um, the way that most people w live their lives now is that their job, that they spend more time at work than they do with their family. Um, I've actually got quite a good balance to be honest, apart from when I'm away from home, but when I'm home, I'm, I usually, I try and, like, I'll, I'll pretty much make dinner every night, you know, I'll, um, I like cooking, I like putting my daughter to bed and walk, all that sort of stuff. Um, Oh gosh, sorry. Repeat your question again. So I'm going off topic just once more. No problem at all. What's your purpose in life? Right. So doing a job that I'm happy in, if, if I'm being selfish, first of all, for me, for, for my, the Kevin Quantum universe, I feel I'm, I'm good right now. I'm in a good headspace. I'm really happy with my work. I'm so happy with it, where it's going. Um, so that's that's a big part of what I think makes a happy life for someone. Mm -hmm. Having friends and family close by, that is hugely important to me as well. I love my family. Um, I love seeing my mum and dad. When I was in America, my sister lives in Canada, but she came down to Oregon when we were there. She, we spent a week together, you know, we played tennis and <laughs> we, we lived old rivalries. Um, that's really important. But uh, what is is there a purpose outside of my sphere? So if we go outside of me to my family, that I want to make sure that I'm giving the best life I possibly can to my daughter, making my wife happy, you know, protecting and securing our future, um, being there for my friends. I, I've got a really close group of friends. Again, I was best man. It's the third time I've been best man. It's crazy. Um, to my, my friend Mark, I love him to bits, and all my friends from university were tight. Although we live all over the place now, we're tight, and we all came back together for the weekend. As a magician, so outside of that, what is my purpose in the world? Mm. If someone were to look down and think, what, how are you contributing to society? If we take kind of more of a socialist point of view, I would say my job is to bring joy to people, um, and that's not my words. That's someone else's words. That's my mate Eddie, who is a prison warden. Um, I think he's probably closer to humanity than I ever will be in a lot of respects. But he says what he loves about my job is that I'm able to bring joy to people. And I think that's probably as succinct as I can make it. Yeah. Um, if, if I can bring a message in, if I can educate and uh, as well as is that but overwhelmingly it's about joy yeah if i want yeah. people to leave with a big smile on their face of every show that i do and if i can uh, yeah take them out there's all this like uh, kind of catch phrases in the magic world you know i want to experience like that childlike state of wonder and all this you hear this from every other magician um but for me i think it's joy <laughs> yeah and everything else is a bit more selfish um, <laughs> You, you, you earlier on you mentioned um, Magic Fest being part of a kind of legacy thing, but you know, out, out with that, what would you like your legacy to be? How would you like to be remembered? It's it's really difficult. Um, I've, I've never thought myself. I've never actually stood back and thought, okay, I'm gone. Um, how do people see me? I'm not ever, I never thought about that. Um, I've never had the need to. I kind of always just live in the present or the near future. Um, for Magic Fest, it's easy to be, you know, to be um, found on the Wikipedia page or whatever the future equivalent is that he founded the, the Edinburgh International Magic Festival that still goes to this day. You know, that, that mm -hmm. would be amazing if I could get to that point. Who knows? Um, from Kevin the Magician. I was in Austria when Paul Daniels died with a Ukrainian magician uh, called Veronin, who I think is a brilliant guy. And we were just on one of these crazy adventures where we were meeting with these really wealthy people to see if they were going to give us a ton of money to make a show in Austria, right? This is one of these things. You just find yourself in these stupid situations. <laughs> so I was in the back of a taxi with Verona and, and we're just, you know, catching up, having a laugh. 
nothing ever came to it, of course. Nothing ever does, really. <laughs> Waiting for that one big one. And uh, I was on my phone. I said, oh, my God, Paul Daniels has passed away. And we were like, oh, wow, you know, that's, that's massive. And we just started telling stories about Paul Daniels and what made him great. Now, he maybe suffered in the later part of his career, overexposure. He did more hours on television than any other magician. And unfortunately, quality of content, it, it, just, it just goes down, unfortunately. Just for him, he was pushed and pushed to, to make more and more stuff. And, mm -hmm. and unfortunately, that's just... Uh, but he made 147, I remember this because he always used to go on about it, 147 hours or shows worth of magic, more than any other magician has ever done. And he was really proud of that. And he had that clear legacy and he was touring up until he died. You know, the, he was planning his final tour, you know, the, mm. when he, when he um, it was a really sad way he passed away, but because he, he had a... His memory was affected, so he woke up every morning having forgotten that he had a terminal illness, and he just went out to his, his workshop and started working on his illusions again. And every, you know, it's kind of like Memento, I don't know if you've seen that movie. Yeah, when when, yeah, when yeah. their heart was in it, they would speak to him and tell him, uh, you know, gosh, what, and he's like, why are all my bloody kids coming around? Why are they getting in the way? I'm trying to work out, you know? <laughs> and they were, it was a difficult, difficult mm. for him. Uh, Lafayette. He died twice, you know, officially. His body double was, you know the story of the Great Lafayette? Uh, not intimately, no. Uh, I, I suppose I'm trying to approach this question of, of how I look at other past magicians. Mm -hmm. And they've left a legacy. I would love someone to come across a book with my life works in it. In 200 years time, a young magician, and they're working on some kind of weird virtual reality platform, or they're doing a school project, and there's this archaic thing called magic, which is really alien to them, because they don't understand what it could possibly be anymore. Um, because everyone's got superpowers, or they live in a virtual world where yeah. um, where you can do whatever you want, you know, where, where the, the goal of magic's been accomplished by everyone, so it's, it's, everyone's a magician. Um, and he's reading, like, about these people that used to try and manipulate despite being held by the same rules, conditions, forces of everyone else, they tried to manipulate. And this guy did, this guy was trying to bridge the gap between what we call science and, and what they called magic back then. And, and they read a really, and a paragraph, in fact, their attention spans will probably be two seconds by that point, won't they? They will have the shortest attention span. They'll just look yeah. at me, science magician hybrid. Oh, that's interesting. And if, if in 200 years time, he reads that one line and thinks, I'll read more. <laughs> then I think I'll be proud. <laughs> Even if it's one more sentence, right? I think because uh, the way things are going, people's attention spans will be so short in the future that um, if you can grab them with one thing and they read more, then, then I'll be happy. If, yeah. Yeah, I guess uh, if my Wikipedia entry is, is read more than 5,000 times per year. <laughs> <laughs> with a very small decay rate, <laughs> <laughs> then I'll be happy. How, how does that sound? Is that good? I like it. I'm I like trying it. to combine science yeah. and magic here. Decay, awesome. Got a decay rate in there from my <laughs> nuclear physics. And uh, <laughs> I think that's as good as it's going to get. Yeah. <laughs> what, what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Uh, yeah, it's really difficult to say because often nuggets of advice uh, come into my head when I'm in a situation where they're useful to me. Mm. Um, probably, um, to keep as many fishing lines as you can in the sea. Yeah, never, uh, just keep, keep as many lines as you can in the sea because you just never know what's gonna, what you're going to catch, you know. And I, I guess that comes down to the whole risk-taking thing. This is a Russian proverb that I'm terribly, badly translating into English, but the idea is that you can, if you've got five lines in the sea and someone's got one line in the sea, then they're kind of hedging their bets on. But if you've got lots of, and it's about making connections with people, speaking to people, taking chances, and having lo just a few things going on and never really burning your bridges anywhere, then... Uh, you just find that life will throw up these weird opportunities that can take you in a completely different 
direction. So yeah, I, I just, for me, it's about, if you've got this one chance in life, then, uh, then, then just do as many amazing things as you can with it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that whole idea about having a lot of lines in the sea resonates with me because I, I feel like that's how my life is. And something that I did five years ago um, may just come up and they're like, oh, we, we met, we did this, let's do something together. That happens more and more often these days just because I'm meeting so many different people. And it kind of works like that in my shows as well. But whenever I'm building it, often I'll set up three or four jokes at the start of my show or things at the start of my show that don't come fr till fruition until maybe 30 or 40 minutes in. And then for whatever reason, they will, the audience, because that's where the audience are right now, they're, over the, they're not over there, they're over there. You're behind the scenes. You're, you're <laughs> seeing how the thumb trick works. These from, from, you see? The audience will, um, <laughs> they appreciate it. They just know, you know in your heart that the person on stage has gone to a lot of trouble to construct something. And you, you laugh harder as a response. You don't deconstruct it because you're too caught up in the moment. But you know and that visceral reaction of laughing harder and louder happens. And that's what I love. And I guess that just from, from having you setting up things, you don't know where they're going to go. Sometimes you don't know where, okay, a show's maybe more planned than that. In life, you just don't know what's going to happen. So you just set yeah. up a lot of different things on the go. And then uh, you obviously you keep your boat afloat. Obviously, you have to keep the boat afloat. The boat's the most important thing in this analogy. The boat goes to your... your <laughs> You're going to be with it. You're going to be, become a fish. You don't want to be... Don't be <laughs> um, really, this analogy can, can work out so many different ways, can't it? Um, yeah, so that's... If you can actually make any sense of that whatsoever, <laughs> then... Uh, then uh, come back to me and explain what I'm trying to say to you. I yeah. like it. No, it's, it is a really good, uh, a good philosophy. Yeah, having, having, it's, it's giving, philosophy, giving your, isn't it? Giving yeah. yourself options. Yeah, I guess that's what it... That you've, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you've summarised that... <laughs> So well. That's why you're the interviewer. <laughs> it's your job. <laughs> You've done it well. Yeah. Thank you. If you had the opportunity to speak to your 20-year-old self, what yep. would you say? Um, <laughs> ah, yeah, that's difficult. I would just say um, probably get a haircut and uh, stop wearing really rubbishy clothes probably i would say that quite early on and um uh go and speak to girls um because they're waiting for nice guys to speak to them because <laughs> right? uh, i was much more of a wallflower back then i would it would take a lot for me to go and speak to a stranger especially one of the opposite sex that i felt in any way attracted to mm -hmm. um so i'd probably say that um I had the benefit of growing up in Scotland and Scotland's such a wonderful place to grow up. So I don't have any regrets. I had opportunities. I got to go to an amazing university and mix with people from all walks of life, uh, from, from people with, with, you know, titles that have been passed down through generations to uh, you know, people that live in castles, uh, <laughs> to people that, whose houses have 20 odd rooms. So when, when, they, when they turn 21, they could, you could go to their house for a party and, and not have to sleep on the living room floor. You know, you have your own place. We, weird then to people that have become carpet store merchants or prison. I've, I've had a really amazing opportunity to meet so many people from all walks of life. So I wouldn't change much about my upbringing because I really value that. I really value having made all these connections with all these different people. It's made me who I am. Mm -hmm. It's made me the performer I am. It's made me consider it, it's made me understanding. I, I think it's not made me, I try not to be condescending at some things, like smugness just comes with being in a position of power at times as a magician. Mm. And, and I try to address that head on often by asking my audience, you know, how, how smug do you want me? One to 10, you decide, you know, bring that shit on, you know, <laughs> whatever, you know, you can, and then you ramp it up depending, but then at least you're, you're letting them aware that you know that this is the power position that you're in and you can't yeah. help it. It's just, I'm a magician. <laughs> so I have to be a bit smug. I can't help it, you know? All right. <laughs> you, know, you do. Uh, so again, I, I just had such a good upbringing. I've got a great family life. I'd probably just say, yeah, I wouldn't change much. I just, I would maybe tell myself to take the blinkers off a little bit. Mm. Um, mm. Just have a look around you. 
Um, but there's not much. I just, I really feel like everything, by doing that, what you're asking me to do is change my destiny, all right? But by me speaking, by me going back in time and like, you know, Marty McFly and speaking to my, my younger self may affect where I am now. So, right, I, okay, I wouldn't say anything to him. Hmm. I would just let him do what he's done because if he doesn't, then I don't exist and we're in some weird kind of time paradox. So yeah, fuck that. Yeah. No way. <laughs> don't say anything to your younger <laughs> self or you cease to be the person you are today. That's my advice. If you ever have a time machine, don't do it. <laughs> yes, it, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the <laughs> film uh, The Butterfly Effect with Ashton Kutcher, which is, uh, is very much like that, yeah. It's quite scary. And you're right, from a scientific perspective, you could throw yourself massively off course. Yeah. You do, yeah. You're yeah, going yeah. to get screwed. You'll, you'll find that as soon as you start delivering that speech to your, yourself, that you start to disappear. Like the <laughs> photograph that Martin McFly had in 1962 yeah. or whatever it was. <laughs> the deep sea ball. <laughs> I don't want to be that. Yeah, yeah. You're playing Earth Angel and disappearing on stage. <laughs> Fuck that. It's, it's horrible. <laughs> uh, last one's big. Yeah, uh, okay. If you could change anything in yeah. the world, what would it be? Oh my God. Why? Anything in the world. That is huge. <laughs> <sighs> I just wish, I think the easiest thing to say is I wish people were more considerate of other people. I think that's the only thing I would change. If, if we're at a point just now where there's a scale of one to 10 and the world has a level five consideration, then I wish we could move that up a few notches. Because I think that would help. I think being more considerate, I think, would solve future energy problems, would solve megalomaniacs being in control of world powers. Uh, I think it would solve so much more if every single person was 40% more considerate. I think that's what I would, I would stop people, you know, speaking on their phones and quiet coaches on the train bugs the hell out of me. <laughs> you know, it would make them go to the vestibule area, which is what any kind of civilised person should do, surely. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's got small ramifications, it's got big ramifications. Yeah. I think increasing the considerate, the level of consideration that people have for others by a factor of 30 to 40%, I think that's what I would change. <laughs> you said that we were at a level five. I mean, do you believe that? Well, I was just taking um, As a, yeah. an average, and I thought I'll just five out of ten. The one to ten scale is one that everyone can relate to. So sure. I, where uh, are we? <laughs> how considerate can you be? You can get to a point where you're too considerate and, and you stop being selfish. Uh, and selfish, you need to be a bit selfish, I think, especially, I mean, capitalism is built on selfishness. So, <laughs> I mean, the world, we'd probably, if we did increase consideration by that percentage, we'd find ourselves slipping probably into a more socialist world. I think... Capitalism would, would certainly would take a hit because I don't think people would, would be out for themselves as much as they are in the world that we live in just now, mm. which I think can only be a good thing. For, I, I, I don't know, is it me? I, I think long term, like for, in terms of the, the world and the grand scheme of things, and we're talking about growth and I, we're off topic, completely off topic here. <laughs> and I don't expect you to put this in the interview, but if we don't grow every year, then it's a massive problem, isn't it? This growth, oh, we didn't, we grew by half a percent. Oh God, woes. And I'm like, there's a limited amount of resources and we just can't grow forever. Mm. And we're in a period now where the UK certainly seems to, there seems to be a rejigging of how much we earn or, as a society. And I, I think the only way the human race can survive is with a more socialist outlook anyway. So. I just don't think capitalism can work. It can only work in the short term. It just two or three more generations, I think we're we're going to see have problems. We we've used up all the resources, and <laughs> there's nowhere for us to go. Yeah. So be considerate. Be considerate. Yeah. All right. Twenty percent more. Just make that your aim. Twenty percent. I'm not going to ask miracles. All right. Twenty percent more. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and if that means you don't annoy somebody with your mobile phone conversations or you hold the door open for someone or you're just aware, just aware of, of you taking the last cupcake in the supermarket or whatever, then, <laughs> then that's, that makes the world a better place. I love it. All right, Elliot. What a great answer. <laughs>
<laughs> Kevin, I've, I've loved speaking with you. It's, it's been, been a great pleasure. Fun. Yeah, yeah. It's I hope you've enjoyed it. It's been, uh, I have. It's I been have. a huge amount of time. God, yeah, I feel like I've like uh, got a lot off my chest. I feel. This is. I can yeah. see why people like this. Yeah, talking yeah. about. I mean, talking about yourself. Just yeah, it is, isn't it? Just there's <laughs> a sort of catharsis sweeping over me just now. Got good. a load off my chest. Good, good. I'm glad. Mm. I'm glad. Well, I, I, as I say, I've had a great time. And, uh, Thanks, Ellie. Yeah. yeah, it's been a pleasure. Yeah. It really has. Thanks for um, inviting me to your lovely home and setting me on such comfortable sofas. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Uh,